The year 1884. Christiania, capital city of Norway. With beer halls, cafes, several Tivoli music halls, but with no opera, no ballet, and no academy of art. This is a video essay about the 1974 Peter Watkins film, Edvard Munch, which I first saw not on TV at home, not in the cinema, but while studying an art history course in June 1991. The film was created by Watkins for the Norwegian state broadcaster NRK and was originally designed to be a three-part TV movie, but it was later re-edited into one enormous three-and-a-half-hour film. In 1976, this feature-length version of the film was taken to the Cannes Film Festival, but it was not entered into the main competition. Other films which did not make it into the main competition that year included Novicento by Bertolucci, Face to Face by Bergman, and Family Plot by Hitchcock. Jeez, what did a guy have to do to be selected for the competition in 1976? Now I'm going to lay my cards on the table much earlier than normal and say that I think Edvard Munch is the greatest film ever made by a British director. Hands down, there is no competition for me. But before I get into the film itself and why I think it's so great, I want to talk about the context of watching the film in an art history course. Now if you didn't study art history in the 1990s, then you may be unfamiliar with the setup. You sit in the dark, listening to the hum of a slide carousel, one of these, and you make notes while someone talks. It didn't hurt that I did this art history course in a building called Thorpe Lodge either. Look at this place, beautiful. Originally built in 1816. Sitting in that building, listening to the murmur of the carousel was like entering a dream world, a world where all that mattered was art, life, pain, color, wonderful. For example, a painting by Edvard Munch comes up, accompanied by his name and the dates of his birth and death. 1863 to 1944. Everyone writes this down. Everyone always writes numbers down. His paintings had gone through in chronological order. His 1882 self-portrait, his 1884 painting of his sister, Inger in Black, The Sick Child from 1886, a recreation of a memory of watching his sister dying in 1877. Evening on Karl Johan in 1892, The Voice from 1893, The Day After from 1895, Kiss from 1896, and so on and so forth. You hear about the critical reception these paintings received, how the Norwegian art institutions and critics hated his paintings, how Munch's family were well known to the ruling middle classes of the time, and how Munch was known to come from a troubled family, and he was most likely known to be a troubled man himself. His attitude to women, his obsession with Dagny Yule, who he painted as Madonna in 1894, his affair with Dagny, a response from her husband, Stanislav Shubashevsky, and how this love triangle ended up being the subject of the 1895 painting, Jealousy. That's Shubashevsky in the foreground, Munk and Yule in the background. His relationship with the woman known as Mrs. Hayberg, not her real name, and how this was eventually usurped by his relationship with Tulla Larsen. The change from one relationship to another is seen here in the 1899 painting, The Dance of Life. Munk's relationship with Tulla Larsen was to descend into drunken anarchy. Eventually, they would lock themselves in a the room together where they would scream and fight, and where Munk would eventually shoot himself in the hand. He created a series of paintings based on this period of his life called The Green Room in 1907. Tick follows tock, follows tick, follows tock. Time marches on, and through these paintings, you not only look at one person's life, but you see inside of that person. You see what they fear, what they desire, what they regret, and what they hope for. You talk about how they became the person we know them as. You talk about their childhood, how Munk was born into a Protestant family in Oslo, then known as Christiania. His early life was colored by sickness, death, and insanity. His mother, sister, and grandmother all died before their time from tuberculosis. Munk himself suffered a pulmonary hemorrhage on Christmas Day, 100 years before I was born, which may or may not have been a result of tuberculosis. His weak lungs plagued him for the rest of his life. His grandfather had gone insane from an infection of the spinal cord. His father ruled the house with a mania that left Munch terrified. You talk about his friends, known as the Behem, how they encouraged the artist to go deeper, to paint what could not be seen, to focus on emotions, on feelings, and Munch dove into this. He wrote in his diary, there should be no more pictures of interiors, of people reading, and women knitting. There would be pictures of real people who breathed, who suffered, felt, loved. Jealousy, anxiety, melancholy, lust. This is what drove Edvard Munch. This is what he wanted to capture, and this is what we remember him for. Back in June 1991, when I first saw the Edvard Munch film, the Soviet Union was dissolving. First Gulf War was coming to an end. Nirvana released their album Nevermind, astonishingly. It outsold the new Michael Jackson album. And the World Wide Web was introduced by Tim Berners-Lee at CERN in Switzerland. The year before that, in 1990, I had visited the Royal Academy's exhibition of Munch's Leaf Friesen, or The Freeze of Life, a collection of paintings created by Munch with similar themes which, when hung together, created, for Munch, a musical note that ran through all of them and tied them all together. I was familiar with these paintings, had postcards of some of them on my walls at home, and was eager to know more. 
It also didn't hurt that I'd experienced a lot of what Monk had experienced. I also lost a sister early on. I contracted tuberculosis as a child. Which is not to say that I ever identified with Edvard Munch, because I didn't, but I did, and do, recognise the feelings of much of what he went through. So in 1974, the year in which People magazine was launched, Philippe Petit tightrope walked between the twin towers of the World Trade Center, the Watergate scandal forced Nixon to resign, and Baryshnikov defected from the USSR, when Peter Watkins negotiated NRK's approval for his film on the life of Edvard Munch, what exactly did he do and why do I think it's so special? First of all, let's talk about biopics briefly. Biopics are films that tell the story of a person, of someone's life. They are not the best category of film ever, and here is the problem. Biopics often get wrapped up in the bullet points of someone's life. They can feel like you're watching a film adaptation of a Wikipedia page. This happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and finally, death occurs. Biopics have to cram all the and then this happened moments from a person's life into their running time, but they rarely get into what it felt like to be that person. And most of our lives are wrapped up in how we feel at any given moment. But Peter Watkins, Edvard Munch, is very different. The principal factor in all this is how it's made. It's shot like a documentary. It's shot as though there is a 16mm camera in the room with these people in the 1890s. The characters look at you time and time again. Sometimes they hold your gaze. Sometimes their eyes flit to you and then away, playfully. Sometimes the eye, which is your eye as you watch the film, might be Monk's eye. Sometimes Monk is in the scene looking at these people and then at you. Looking and being looked at are important here. It's a little bit like how found footage horror films work. Obviously, the Blair Witch Project isn't real, we all know that, but the way that it's made temporarily stops you from thinking that this is fake, that this is just a film, if only for the tiniest moment. Most films don't want you to think about how they're made. They don't want you to think that there's a camera in the room. They don't want you to wonder where the light is coming from. They're looking to create no resistance for you. Smooth passage. You slide into their existence. You don't think about how they're made. But found footage films want you to think about the camera in the room. They want you to wonder why something is being filmed. And they introduce a world where the characters know there is a camera there. We know full well that there were no to camera interviews in the 19th century. We know that Munch's Bohem group of friends were not observed by a moving picture camera. And yet here they are, large as life, and fully aware that you are watching them. Not only does this feel like you're observing lives, but it also ends up recreating the feeling that a lot of Munch's paintings have. Watching and being watched, confrontation, eye contact. Watkins never recreates a Munch painting in the film, as you might expect from a biopic about an artist. He simply evokes the feeling of a Munch painting for the entire running time of the film. Neither does he show us the aha moment that comes in some other art biopics where an artist is looking at something and we see how their inspiration works and we see the painting they are about to create. Munch is simply existing and working on his canvases constantly. And then there is the representation of time. Normally, a biopic works like time's arrow, always moving forward. We see one moment in a person's life, followed by another, and slowly the central figure becomes closer and closer to the historical figure that we know, until eventually the film reaches the point at which the subject of our biopic is fully formed. But that's not how Edvard Munch works. Time is fluid here. Different moments in Munch's life are presented next to each other, even though they are separated by huge swathes of time. Because how else do we experience our own lives apart from all at once? Our bodies are trapped in the slow world of time's arrow, only moving forward as the seconds tick by, held like bugs in amber in the moment that we are experiencing. But our minds, our memories, well these are free to skip from one moment to another, wherever we wish to go. We can hold our childhood and adolescence next to our adulthood, and we can have them all happening at the same time if we wish, all while our bodies are trapped in the now. It's very easy to look at a finished life and create a fixed narrative out of it. But that's not how we experience life as it happens. Everything is happening at the same time for us and inside of us. We experience most of life inside ourselves. We feel and think our way through our own lives. And other people can only catch glimpses of the enormity of what is happening inside of us. Other people never really get to know all of the things happening inside of us. And because of this, other people never really get to know who we are. If you look at a photo of me, 
You only see the outside of me, but if I look at a photo of me, I can see the outside of myself and the inside. I know what I was thinking, feeling, and because of this, I find photographs uncomfortable, revealing. It feels like they show too much, which is ridiculous because you can't see any of my interior, but that's how it feels. To add to this, we usually only know people in one particular way. A person is known to us as a friend, or a son, or a father, or a sister, or a mother, or a brother, or a lover. We are complicated. We are multiple interpretations of the same person to different people. We are all a friend, brother, sister, mother, father, lover. It's the perspective of the viewer that creates this association of who we are. We are also never really finished as a person. We don't reach a point where we stop developing. We are ever changing, ever growing. Are you the same person that you were a year ago? Five years ago? 10 years ago? 20 years ago? Of course not. And we are also ever trapped in our interior world of obsessions. Obsessions which begin inside of us and which other people are unlikely to ever really grasp the enormity of. Look at how the film meets our gaze with woman after 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 woman. Edvard Munch, the human, was obsessed with women, fearful of them, filled with anxieties about them, lustful for them. And Edvard Munch, the film, has us looking at the world and these women as though we were Edvard. Monk the human. Somehow, Edvard Monk the film is not simply looking at the outside of Monk, the exterior that other people saw, it is also looking at his interior, his most private thoughts. Gear Westby, who plays Monk, reads extracts from Monk's own diaries throughout the film, allowing us an insight into how the artist was feeling during the periods we're seeing on the screen. Hun hevet sig opp mot ham. Han følte en varm munn ved sin hals. En våt munn mot sin. Og hans munn gled inn mot hennes. And look at how the film pictures sickness and death time and time again. Look at how it tells us when its figures will die and when and how. All of us are moving towards a death that we know will happen, but we don't know when. Most biopics wait until the end of the film to provide text on the screen that tells you the fates of the lives you have been watching. But in Edvard Munch, these future deaths are with us in the present that we are witnessing. That casts an eerie fatalistic light over everything. Feel how your understanding of these faces changes as you listen to the voiceover. The writer Carl Jensen Yell will die of stomach tuberculosis within a month. And six more of the young men at this table, many of them personal friends of Munch, will not reach the age of 40. Bertrand Hansen will die of consumption. Jürgen Sørensen will die an invalid. And the popular painter Kalle Loken will kill himself at the age of 28. Which brings us to the wider world. Repeatedly, the voiceover to Edvard Munch, provided by Watkins himself, tells us the year and what is happening in other parts of the world at the same time, creating something larger than the sum of one person. Instead, this is one person built not only by their childhood, obsessions, friends, and relationships, but also the influences of the wider world. 1889. The Eiffel Tower is built and the box camera comes into production. Vincent van Gogh paints landscape with olive trees and wheat field with cypresses. And Adolf Hitler is born. And then there are the performances themselves. No one in Edvard Munch is a professional actor. Everyone is an amateur or a non-actor. Appearing in this film, or in fact any film, is a one-time deal for pretty much everyone in the film. And if I hadn't told you that, you would never in a million years have been able to tell. There is a naturalism and spontaneity to the performances that is almost unparalleled. You never feel like you're watching people acting, it simply feels like you're watching people being. Gear Westby does not feel like an actor playing Munch, he feels like Edvard Munch. <laughs> Det er langt om innen. 
And then there is the fact that there are no major moments in Edvard Munch, no key scenes of conflict or revelation. Instead, Edvard Munch is made up of all the small moments of his life, which are, after all, the big moments. And these moments transcend time and space by being placed next to each other, an entire life happening concurrently, a life in which we are always knowingly observing and being observed, a life in which we spend real bodily time watching the paintings and lithographs being created, a world in which we enter the time it takes to create something, the canvas being brushed, scratched, brought out of the world of flat paintings and into the textured world that we actually live in. Working in hotel bedrooms, on park and railway station benches, in bars and restaurants, using the small piece of copper which he carries in his pocket, Edward Munch begins his first engraving, the theme which he captured at the prior year on his canvas, Death and the Maiden. A naked woman, stretched on tiptoe, presses her full body into the embrace of death. And then there's Norway, a country in the far north where the light from the sun hits the landscape of the planet at a different angle. A country where the summer light, reflecting off the water, creates a different reality to the winter light that bounces off the snow and falls onto faces. We cannot travel to the 1890s that Edvard Munch lived in, but we can see the same light that he saw. We can see the same rocks that he once stood on. And then there is the light of the interiors, dark, shadowy, filled with smoke, creating a haze, a dream. And when you put all of these elements together what happens is an accumulation of everything. The form, the way it's filmed, bleeds into the reading of the diaries and the understanding of Monk's interior which bleeds into the wider socio-political settings, which bleeds into the naturalistic performances, which bleeds into the fragmented time, which bleeds into the light which washes over everything. The result is something possibly closer to a novel than a film. You can spend days or even weeks reading a novel and if you wanted to tell someone what happened in that novel you could summarize it in a few minutes, possibly even and less. But we don't read novels to attain the general shape or understanding of a story. We don't read a book so that we can explain it to someone in a minute. We read novels to experience an accumulative effect of word following word, moment following moment, to create something that our minds are free to experience all of at one time. Films very often don't do this. Films most usually move as time's arrow, forwards and forwards and forwards, and the story inside is revealed to us layer by layer, like peeling the skin from an onion. This is one of those rare three and a half hour films where as soon as it ends, I wish it was starting all over again. It's a film that lets us think about our own lives and the world that we live in as we watch it. It's a film in which we are simultaneously trapped in the 19th century and the now of whenever it is that we're watching the film. As we wander down the corridors of all the people we've ever known and all the tragedies that have ever befallen us. It's a film that takes me back to that quiet dark room of 1991 and all the promise and potential that it and I contained. In 1982, Louise Brooks published a series of essays and in one of them she wrote, I have been taking stock of my 50 years since I left Wichita. How I have existed fills me with horror for I failed everything. Spelling, arithmetic, writing, swimming, tennis, golf, dancing, singing, acting, wife, mistress, or friend, even cooking. And I do not excuse myself with the usual escape of not trying. I tried with all my heart. Being human and living a life is complicated and difficult and personal, messy and painful, not to mention long. In 1974, Peter Watkins created a faultless template for exploring a life. Edvard Munch is simultaneously a film and a documentary and a drama and a history lesson and a socio-political essay and an art history lecture and a psychological journey and a how-to filmmaking lesson. It is an insight into what it is to be human, what it is to see, be seen, feel, suffer, love and hope. The existence of this film continuously gives me hope. But who knows, maybe it's not for you. If it's not for you, then somewhere out there, there is a giant of a film which articulates everything that Edvard Munch articulates for me. A fragile beauty that will summarize existence for you. Your own existence and the existence of those around you and the existence of those who came before you. And when you find that film, you will hold it close, weep in its arms and treasure it. I felt as if there were invisible threads between us. I felt as if invisible threads from her hair still twisted themselves around me. And when she completely disappeared there over the ocean, then I felt still how it hurt where my heart bled. 
because the threads could not be broken.